My name's Donna Archie. Um, I'm a Bundjalung woman from the far north coast of New South Wales, uh, but I've been living in Alice Springs for the last uh, 26 years. Uh, married into a local family, married to a, a um, R and a Yankundara man, and we've um, had three children. Oh, gee, I've been working in this area now for about, oh, I think it's probably about 13 years, 14 years, and before that worked in adult education, uh, worked at the Institute for Aboriginal Development, another Aboriginal community controlled um, organisation. So the last, um, the last um, you know, 25 years of my life has been working in Aboriginal community control. I, I, I worked in government before I, um, before I, I um, uh, went and worked in the Aboriginal community control sector and I think that working in both has been very useful. Um, I think that we should never criticise or I think constructively criticise I think is a fair thing to do of our own mob that work in government because we do need good uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people working inside, working in government that enables that sort of change that needs to occur inside the bureaucracy. Um, but equally as important and perhaps even more important is ensuring that we're building the capacity in our own communities and that our own people are running our own um, services and being in control of that. So that's where the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Sector has really led the way for the last um, uh, 40 years in that regard. Well, I think it's taken, I think it's taken um, uh, many years of, of, of development and evolution. I think that now, when we first started off, we were much smaller services and, um, you know, didn't necessarily require the kind of additional skills, I would say, uh, today because of, um, of us transforming into these uh, multi-million dollar service organisations. Um, so with that transition and that development that's occurred over the years, and rightly so, because we are providing uh, those much needed primary healthcare services in our communities, but as we've grown bigger, so has the necessity to be able to ensure that we're uh, providing good governance, good leadership, and ultimately quality primary health care. Well, governance is important because it's Aboriginal people that are in control and are ultimately making decisions um, in response to the community needs. So. Uh, you can, you can actually see where there isn't an Aboriginal community controlled health service in the Northern Territory, uh, where you can see that there is limited, although the Department of Health would um, try their best they can to some degree about um, having Aboriginal participation uh, and input into their service, but ultimately the uh, best way to have Aboriginal people's engagement in an Aboriginal health service is for them to have the control of that service. In 20 years time, hopefully we're going to see a lot more Aboriginal community controlled primary health care uh, services uh, established around the country. I think we've come to a point in that sort of development that we're not seeing as many uh, develop as we used to. Uh, they are happening in pockets of, of, um, of Australia, like we've got in southeast Queensland, where they have been, you know, establishing small um, sort of satellite clinics. But when you look in in areas where there's large geographic, um, you know, um, uh, areas that we need to see the establishment of Aboriginal community controlled health services in their role, in their own right, uh, responding to that particular geographic location and the community in which that, that um, you know, surrounds. My personal vision is really about the sorts of work that we've been doing at a local level at Congress in Alice Springs 
is to see some of those things. I think we've all got something to share that we're doing in our particular services around the country. And in bringing some of those um, key elements of service de delivery together, I think what we'll find is truly a comprehensive primary healthcare service. So that's what I want to see, I'd love to see, um, you know, achieved in the years to come, that we do have the depth and breadth of um, services and programs, the sorts of policy and advocacy work that can be done at a local level and not just be left to our peak bodies um, in our jurisdictions or NACHO as our national body, but collectively we're all doing our bit uh, around advocacy as well. So it, um, an, an area of interest is, is for us is early childhood at the moment. So that's something that I think we need to see progress in future years as a, um, as a focus. That's why we're putting a lot of emphasis uh, now in that particular area. We think that there is a gap. People talk about primary prevention, um, but most times it's about early intervention or even to some degree um, an element of, of yeah, of, of not progressing something that's already, um, already there on our do doorstep. So, when we talk about prevention, we're talking primary prevention, which is ultimately getting in really, really early, which is from naught to three. And because um, there is evidence that is becoming, um, you know, more and more evidence around the development of the brain and what that can do in the context of um, maximising a child's potential in future, life, in future years in relation to their educational outcomes, which then have a subsequent flow-on effect, um, as evidence has shown, that if you have a good education, you get to year 12, go on to university, you're you know, unlikely to end up you know, in the juvenile justice system, um, more likely to, get, to be getting a, a high paid job, less likely to be addicted to alcohol and other drugs. So, um, the evidence is there. We've just got to make, um, I guess, governments accountable about where they invest the money because uh, there has been a focus on early childhood by governments in more recent years. The issue is, is where they're actually putting the investment.